so we have our next panel is actually uh, contains some of the most eminent minds in Canada. Um, if you're here, uh, instead of listening to Ban Ki Moon's speech, you're in the right place. <laughs> um, so, by means of introduction, I'll uh, possibly just introduce uh, one by one. Um, first of all, we have uh, Rob Steiner. Uh, Rob Steiner is the director of the Fellowships in Global Journalism at the Monk School of uh, Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. Mr. Steiner began his career as a global finance correspondent for the Wall Street Journal, where he was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, won two Overseas Press Club Awards, and the Inter-American Press Association Award. From 2005 to 2010, Mr. Steiner was Assistant Vice President of the University of Toronto in charge of strategic communications. Mr. Steiner also served as Health Policy Advisor and Principal Speechwriter for Honorable Paul Martin, and in 2000, Mr. Steiner managed the Liberal Party of Canada's new media campaign working for Prime Minister uh, Jean Chrétien. So perhaps we'll start with your, uh, your presentation and we'll move down the line. Um, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Et uh, je pense que c'est le cas pour tout le monde. De, je, je vais uh, parler en anglais, mais si vous voulez avoir des questions et des réponses en français ensuite, uh, on pourrait le faire then, however you want to do it. Uh, so we'll just be bilingual in this conversation as well. Um, just by way of very quick background, I run a program at the Monk School, which is actually the only one of its kind in the world. Uh, that is designed to train people who are specialists in their disciplines as, as academics or professionals uh, in journalism so that they can actually cover their own fields as journalists, typically as freelance journalists, for, for media around the world. We're creating a sort of a new model of global correspondence. And the only reason that I mention that, apart from being a shameless plug for anyone who's interested in, uh, in applying, because applications are open now, uh, but the reason I'm mentioning that is because <clears throat> It, it, it informs the, the framework that I bring and the sort of hypothesis I'm going to posit here. I'm not a human rights expert, and I'm not a migration expert. Um, and everything that I say is really sort of just an adjunct, a bit of an ancillary to what, to what my, my panel mates are, are, are going to be saying. But here's, here's what I would uh, argue just as a, as a hypothesis. On all of these things, when we talk about human rights, migration, uh, the issues that have come up in the last uh, number of panels and, and speeches, I think what tends to happen in the back of our minds is we think, okay, this is all well and good, and in this room and among policy-minded people, we can all agree, uh, but then there's always a lack of implementation, even when the intents are great, even when we have a great government in place, et cetera. Uh, and that often comes down to what we sort of term a lack of political will. And you speak to the politicians, and the politicians will tell you, well, that's because people aren't pushing us for this. So it's really a lack of public will. And what does that ultimately mean? It means that on one issue after another, particularly in global affairs, we fail to see our own personal stakes in the issues of others. It was sort of the last question that came up, what are our stakes in desertification? But you could extend it to anything, you can extend it to migration and so on. Um, what I would argue is that our frameworks of intimacy, if you want to call it that way, the sense that we have of our stakes in other people's lives, that actually shifts. And I actually think Montreal is a great example of it. Uh, I used to live here, and when I was here at McGill, up until 91, it was a terrible time in a lot of ways, unless you're a political science student, which I was, it was a terrible time to be here because the city was so profoundly divided. You actually couldn't speak across that divide. Even if you spoke French or English, you couldn't speak across the divide. And revisiting the city now, it, it's very striking that our, our, our sort of sphere of intimacy has opened up. And Anglophones and Francophones are speaking the same language. I don't mean just English or French, but are, are actually speaking about common things in common terms. McGill's become a bilingual environment, that's just one example of it. But I'm mentioning that because it is possible for our spheres of intimacy to extend. And I think what it really comes down to is the way that we tell stories about each other. So uh, my colleagues are in the world of policy and law uh, and, and the product of statutes and treaties. I would say that statutes require stories. And statutes are only effective to the degree that the stories we tell about each other allow us to not just sympathize with others, but empathize with others, actually understand the world from other people's perspectives. So here's where we get to journalism, and I'll just say briefly. We've had a problem doing that thus far in the narratives we get from conventional journalism because conventional foreign correspondents, and actually I should note that one of the best global correspondents, I'm going to call her a global correspondent, not a typical foreign correspondent, is in the room, Michelle Shepard, just sort of sitting in the corner, I think over there. Do I, is that, am I right? Is that you over there? Yeah, there you go. Sorry to out you there, but you'll be hearing from her in a minute, uh, who represents a change in this, I think. But our typical model, our traditional model of foreign correspondence told global stories, transnational stories, through a national lens. A foreign correspondent was sent from country A to country B to cover country B strictly in the interests of country A. 
What that meant was the first question on her or his mind, and in those days it was typically a him, which is another problem, but the, 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 the typical question on her or his mind was, uh, what does their problem mean for people in Canada? What does their problem mean for people in the United States? We're constantly putting other people's problems in our own framework. Now that can work out well if we happen to be in a very generous kind of mood. And it can work out very badly if we're not in a generous mood. But either way, it's limited, it's constrained. And fortunately, and, and it, it, it means that it's impossible for us to actually experience the other as something on their own terms. So our stories don't meet the statutes, which are supposed to actually treat people with dignity on their terms. Our stories are actually still about us, in a way. Fortunately, I would say that old model of foreign correspondence is dying for economic reasons. We can no longer support foreign correspondence around the world. All sorts of daily papers, which used to have foreign correspondence around the world, don't anymore. And what that's forcing media to do is to adopt and develop something that I would call global correspondence, which operates on a bunch of different levels. One is that it actually engages local people local journalists, indigenous journalists, and covering their own stories for us. And I'm not talking about citizen journalism, although that's a different dimension and there's a lot of value in that. I'm talking about professional journalism with the disciplines of reporting. But when you have a locally based journalist who knows her or his country reporting through an editor in country A on her or his stories, you get something that is very different. You get their perspective in their terms. And we're forced to under actually understand their experience in their terms. Uh, and, and build a degree of empathy. The second dimension on which global journalism, I think, is evolving is that it's increasingly possible for specialists of any, of any sort, and this is what I teach, to cover a global story transnationally for audiences around the world from wherever they are. So you can cover global health, you can cover global climate change, you can't cover everything from wherever you are around the world for people everywhere, that's too much. But if you are a global health specialist, if you're a migration specialist, and we have some of them in my program this year, a human rights specialist who has actually a real knowledge of human rights in legal terms, right? Then you can sit anywhere and you can cover that as a global issue for audiences around the world. And one of the consequences is that your stories have to rise to a standard that makes sense to the people who are experiencing the problem. So we're in the fortunate position of being able to read or watch or listen to stories that make as much sense to the people experiencing the problem as they would to us, it forces us to think in their, in their framework. I, I'm just going to wrap up, but I would say we're at the very beginning of this shift, and I would like to think that it will start to, over time, extend, if you will, our sphere of intimacy to the point where our stories sort of meet our statutes, and we can increasingly experience what others are going through in their terms and not just in ours, and I think that's quite hopeful. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker to Mr. Steiner's left is uh, Gillian Sturck. She is a former Canadian ambassador with more than 30 years' experience in public policy, foreign affairs, international trade, and multinational negotiations. Until June 2013, Ms. Sturck was a chief foreign policy officer and assistant deputy minister of strategic policy, global issues, and European affairs at the Department of Global Affairs. She served as Canada's ambassador to Norway uh, from 2005 to 2009. Between 2009 and 2010, she served as Assistant Deputy Minister for the Afghanistan Task Force and led work on the transition from a military to a civilian mission. And uh, Ms. Dirk has also conducted multilateral negotiations during assignments to the Canadian delegations to NATO, the UN office in Vienna, the Organization for Cooperation and Security to NATO, uh, sorry, in Europe, as well as um, the European Union and the Arctic Council. Uh, Ms. Stark is an associate at the Simon Fraser University Center for Dialogue and a mentor with the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation, where she is currently co-leading a project on diversity, pluralism, and the future of citizenship. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. It's a grand plaisir d'être ici. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit this afternoon about how pluralism influences foreign policy and perhaps uh, posit some ideas for an opportunity uh, for Canadian leadership on the issue of global uh, migration. Uh, as Prime Minister Trudeau makes his debut on the world stage, he's been um, championing diversity as the kind of quintessential Canadian value. Uh, it certainly underpinned his remarks at uh, Davos uh, a few weeks ago. And if I can just quote from a, a recent speech that he gave in London, the Prime Minister said, we have a responsibility to ourselves and to the world to show that inclusive diversity is a strength and a force that can van vanquish intolerance, radicalism, and hate. 
Uh, he's taken every opportunity to highlight the government's uh, resettlement program for re Syrian refugees as an example of how pluralism influences foreign policy. But the question I have is, do pluralist societies really uh, have a different kind of foreign policy? Uh, and if so, what would a f pluralist foreign policy actually look like? Um, now, before we kind of launch into that, I should say that, of course, some might argue that Canada does not fully embrace differences and that there is a serious disconnect between the rhetoric and the reality. Certainly, I would say the shameful history um, of relations with Indigenous people and various episodes in the treatment of minorities over the years suggest that there could be a credibility gap. But still, I would argue that Canada's approach to diversity is a successful and distinctive model, whatever its weaknesses may be, whether you measure legal protection, participation, or social cohesion. During the course of my career as a diplomat, uh, whenever I met with uh, foreign governments, business people, academics, NGOs, the conversation inevitably came around to the question of Canada's diversity. Um, and people would ask, how does it work? Uh, how do you take uh, so many people from so many different countries and create a kind of sense of, of shared national identity? What kind of, govern what kind of policies do governments pursue? And I think the reason for that was many of my interlocutors were struggling with the challenges of increasingly diverse societies, and they saw Canada as a model. They saw Canada as a peaceful and prosperous society, and they wanted to be more like us. I see pluralism uh, as both an asset and a form of soft power. Uh, as diplomats have expanded their work from traditional government to government uh, relations to more direct diplomacy, engaging decision makers uh, across society, Pluralism has really been at the heart of the Canadian brand, whether it's in advancing human rights, promoting investment, or uh, underpinning our uh, development assistance agenda. And my former colleague Colin Robertson talked a little bit about uh, this branding yesterday. It's not that others don't bring uh, these same values, but Canada's commitment uh, to diversity and pluralism and the diverse nature of our society is, in my mind, another kind of tool in the diplomatic uh, toolkit in an increasingly complex world. Uh, with more players on the international scene, Canada has less influence, and frankly, Canada's contribution has declined relative to others, and uh, the previous speaker certainly touched on that. So if the new government is looking for an opportunity to put substance behind that slogan of Canada is back, uh, and to advance the value of pluralism, I believe there's an opportunity to lead on what will be one of the defining issues for the 21st century, and that is global migration. Many of you will have seen the recent op-ed in the Globe and Mail by Lloyd Axworthy and Alan Rock on the plight of Syrian refugees and the impossible burden uh, facing the frontline states, Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey. Um, they called for a, an ambitious, coordinated, long-term strategy, a kind of Marshall Plan for the region. I agree with their approach, but I think the issue really goes well beyond uh, Syria. The situation is dire and urgent, and um, yet Syrians represent a relatively small percentage of the refugees around the world today. So how do we take the lessons learned from this crisis and from previous mass migrations and apply them more broadly, and even more important, perhaps, prepare better uh, for the new realities? It's increasingly clear that global migration is a long-term trend. It's an intrinsic feature, if you like, of globalization. There are 240 million people today living outside their countries of origin, and at least 20 million of them are refugees. There are another 40 million who are displaced persons. And to my mind, the definitions of refugees, IDPs, uh, involuntary migrants, economic migrants, temporary foreign workers are becoming increasingly blurred. It's also clear that the nexus between migration, human rights, and international policy is a patchwork of legal, political, economic, and social measures that are not well adapted to deal with the current realities. So if the government is serious about making pluralism a cornerstone of Canadian foreign policy, one way to do that would be to launch a comprehensive initiative on global migration governance. It's an issue where the interests of the developed and the developing world often differ, but they can also overlap. It's an area where Canada has extensive experience through immigration and refugee settlement, and we are widely admired. 
equally important, it engages civil society, which is where much of the expertise on these issues reside, especially here in Canada. It would involve a range of international and regional organizations and would reinforce uh, the role of the UN, something which is clearly uh, a priority for the, for the new government. Ban Ki-moon has announced a high-level summit on refugees and migrants for September 2016, so the timing, frankly, could hardly be better. And it's also, I think, a concrete way of challenging radicalization or extremist narratives wherever they may come from. So what might a comprehensive uh, initiative include? I'm going to touch very briefly on a few areas, and perhaps we can come back to some of those in, in the Q&A. First and foremost, I think it would have to address root causes, such as human rights abuses, poor governance, and ethnic conflict, the starting point for uh, mass migration. It should provide comprehensive political and economic support to frontline receiving states, find creative approaches to burden sharing, uh, that include both resettlement and investment in host countries uh, in return for their agreement to, re to integrate those uh, who remain. Should develop tools for the responsible management of migration that respect sovereignty, security, and human rights. Tackle the vulnerabilities facing uh, refugees and other migrants through better governance mechanisms and crack down on human trafficking. Show leadership on resettlement and share best practices among uh, receiving states. And last of all, modernize and streamline the international legal framework and consider whether new legal instruments are required. Of course, none of this would be easy. Uh, it will require long-term investment, collaboration, a sustained effort to bring partners on board, and lots of creative thinking. But this is exactly the kind of thing that Canada did in the past when it led on initiatives like the Landmines Treaty or the creation of the International Criminal Court, achievements that many skeptics thought were impossible at the time. Canada's experience uh, with immigration and resettlement positions us well to launch this kind of initiative. We have tremendous resources at our disposal, from a wealth of academic research to the Global Centre for Pluralism based in Ottawa, uh, to you know, the thousands of engaged communities across the country who are putting pluralism into practice uh, every day. But if I can just conclude here, if Canada is to use pluralism as a form of soft power, projecting ideas and, and interests in the world, Canadians need to close that gap between what we say abroad and what we do at home, starting with a comprehensive process of, of reconciliation with Indigenous people, and then tackling openly and honestly uh, some of the other stereotypes and prejudices which can be so damaging to cohesion and to our credibility abroad. Canada has a tremendous opportunity to use its diversity as a springboard to the, to the world, and by providing leadership on a, a complex global issue like migration, we would be making a long-term contribution to human rights, uh, to peace and security, and to development. And it would be, uh, I'm, to my mind, a step towards an inclusive foreign policy that would define who we are and what we aspire to be. Thank you. Perhaps our next uh, guest needs no introduction, uh, but Mr. Stephen uh, Tupé is the director of the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto, president of the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences, and an officer of the Order of Canada. Um, a former president of the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation and dean of law of McGill University, Tupé also, uh, Mr. Tupé also served as law clerk for the Right Honorable Brian Dixon of the Supreme Court of Canada, and as chair of the United Nations Working Group on Enforced and Involuntary Disappearances. He co-authored Legitimacy and Legality in International Law, an interactional, uh, interactional account with Jeddah Brunet, which won the American Society of International Law's 2011 Certificate of Merit for Creative Scholarship. So I may not need an introduction, but I need my right name, which is Toop, just to, just to put it right. Um, it's uh, an honor to be back at McGill. C'est une très grande honneur d'être ici, et uh, je voudrais remercier uh, les organisateurs uh, pour uh, cette uh, invitation. I flew into Ottawa Airport last night, and uh, I was coming down the very long escalators that take you to uh, where you pick up your bags. And at the bottom of the escalators, there was a whole collection of people holding signs in Arabic, in English, uh, obviously there to welcome uh, some Syrian families who must have been on uh, a flight coming in at the same time as mine. 
And I have to say it was the first time that I had viscerally experienced the sense of welcome uh, that Canadians, uh, I think, have genuinely offered up uh, to Syrian refugees. You well know that we're uh, committed to bringing in roughly 25,000 immediately and perhaps 50,000 over the next year. And then I went to a dinner last night where the Secretary General of the United Nations uh, made uh, an impassioned uh, speech in which he commended uh, Canada uh, for its welcoming of Syrian refugees as a powerful signal of our willingness to re-engage and to help. A powerful signal. But let's be honest, it's not more than a signal. I'm not speaking of the individuals and families concerned or their hosts, because individual lives will be fundamentally transformed, and that is a very good thing. But the real story, as Gillian was suggesting, is happening elsewhere. According to the uh, Office of the High Commissioner for Refugees, there are more than 100,000 refugees in Thailand. We don't think of them much. 660,000 in Kenya. I once visited the Dadaab camp, and there are people who've been living in that camp their whole life. And there are children being born who are likely to live their life in that camp. Almost 3.8 million refugees in the Democratic Republic of Congo. On the borders of Syria and Iraq, fragile countries like Jordan, with more than a million refugees, and Lebanon, 1.8 million, struggle to provide the protection supposedly guaranteed by the 1951 UN Convention on Refugees. Canada's NATO ally, Turkey, is finding it very hard to host more than 2.1 million refugees. Now, what does this mean practically? It means, to link together the themes of this panel, that the basic human rights of millions of people are being denied even amidst this supposed protection. Civil and political rights don't have very much traction when people are massed in camps on borders. What right to expression or to assembly? Most kids are getting no education. We're already starting to hear of a lost generation. Many families can find no health services whatsoever. It's estimated that three out of 10 refugees in Jordan have no access to health assistance. Not to speak of weak sanitation, increasingly precarious access to food. Daily rations are being reduced to bare subsistence levels in many camps. Now, just consider these numbers. From 2010 to 2012, Canada increased its contributions to the UNHCR from 49 to $68 million. In 2013, Canada made, to that time, its highest ever contribution, $77 million. Almost 23 million of that was earmarked for Syrian refugees. Now, in 2014, uh, the, uh, Can the Canadian government actually reduced our contribution just slightly to 73.4 million. Now, the new government, of course, announced in November of 2015 a $100 million commitment to the UNHCR. That's the biggest ever. And the agency uh, was very grateful because it had raised only 45% of the estimated $4.5 billion it sought in 2015 for the 4.3 million refugees that it was trying to deal with or help local countries, Lebanon, Turkey, Jordan, and Iraq, to deal with. There have been new Canadian commitments we heard about earlier uh, for Jordan and Lebanon, blending refugee support and development uh, commitments. This is all good. But now, think of the following numbers. Resettling 25,000 Syrian refugees is estimated to cost Ottawa $900 million during the first year and $1.2 billion over the next six years. So if we do bring in 50,000, and I think it's a good idea, you have to double that, $2.4 billion. Our largest commitment yet to the UNHCR, $100 million. So is this the right policy choice? It's a question I think we have to ask ourselves as Canadians, as generous people, I hope. 
Jordan's Ministry of Planning and International Cooperation estimates that for this year alone, 2015, the impact of the Syrian crisis on Jordan will be $2.1 billion. Jordan's GDP is about $34 billion in total. 1.2 of 34 billion in total. Canada's GDP is roughly 1.8 trillion dollars. Now, there's a real risk associated with all of this that I think we've got to get our minds wrapped around. In Jordan, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace concludes in a recent report that the rapid expansion of the Syrian refugee population, and I'm quoting, has the potential to threaten the stability of the current Jordanian political structure, end quote. That's not a surprise when you've got millions of people flowing into a very small, poor country. A collapse of the Jordanian regime, I think, would be disastrous for refugees, but also disastrous for Jordanians and, quite frankly, for the region and beyond. As Gillian was mentioning, uh, there are lots of different statistics floating around, but there are roughly 60 million displaced people uh, in the world today. That's the highest number since the end of the Second World War. Millions and millions of them are actually refugees, as defined by the UN Refugee Convention. And so we, as parties to that convention, Canada and many other states, have a duty to protect these people. But protecting can't be just about picking safe migrants and bringing them to rich countries like Canada. Gillian made one, I think, very important proposal, and I fully agree with it. We do need to try to work to develop a comprehensive strategy on migration. Canada could play, in my view, should play, for all the reasons that she set out, a leading role. But there's more to consider in all of this. Canada and I think our partners are also going to have to do a lot more to identify emerging conflicts that cause refugee flows and actually try to stem them before they flare. That has to be, it seems to me, in the world that we experience today, a foreign policy priority, both in terms of interest and in terms of our values. That will mean spending more on intelligence and on rapid response capacity in our armed forces, as well as linking development initiatives and security more closely. And there are some tough questions in that. We obviously need a complete review of the Canadian military. Frankly, we don't know what it's for. And we've got to figure that out, I think. Rich countries, I think, also have to do a lot more than we're currently doing to help poor countries where almost all the refugees in the world find themselves. That means a lot more money and more technical aid to places like Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey, which was excluded from the last government announcement. Otherwise, we could face collapse in some of these countries and, of course, even more refugees and they don't all want to come to Canada. Thanks. Uh, so my apologies for getting your, uh, for your name, <laughs> but I'll never be forgotten. Uh, so we will now pass to question and answer periods. Uh, if you could come to the microphone. Again, uh, keep your answers short, but we haven't been having a problem with that today. Uh, so I'd welcome any questions for the panelists. Uh, perhaps to begin uh, to launch the discussion, uh, Jillian, you, sp or, uh, you spoke about this briefly in your presentation, but human rights has not always been a constant within Canadian history. Uh, you spoke about uh, Canada's strong role in participants as, as a participant in the uh, UN Landmines Treaty, but we've known that in the past, uh, in negotiations or in legislation such as that around cluster munitions, actually the legislation we tabled weakened the intent of the treaty, uh, bringing criticisms from many in the international community. So I think as a nation building pillar, we often see human rights as being fundamental to Canada, uh, yet at times it's been, we've had a spotty record. Uh, so perhaps um, we could one of the panelists could discuss this uh, as to how we actually make uh, human rights a, a constant lens through which we see Canadian policy or whether or not this would be actually um, something, a desirable thing to see to apply human rights transversely. Um, 
Well, I'm happy to, to kind of start the discussion off on, on that. Um, I think, as I, I said a, a couple of points in my um, comments, that uh, you know, human rights starts at home. And uh, if you're going to advance human rights on the international scene, uh, you have to be sure that you have your own house in order as, as well. And so starting to think about um, those issues is, is an important starting point. I think human rights should underpin you know, all policy decisions, not just, just foreign policy. Um, and I, I do agree that it should be a central aspect of, of Canada's foreign policy as well. Um, I do acknowledge, though, that um, the world is a complicated place, um, and you know we have to work with a whole range of countries with different experiences, different approaches, um, and that you can't necessarily refuse to to deal with, with other partners simply because you don't like their human rights record. I think you have to try to, to influence them, uh, absolutely. Um, but uh, there, are no, there are no absolutes in, uh, in, in this business. And um, uh, foreign policy is a, is a complicated process that sometimes requires you know, compromises and uh, um, different approaches to, to reach your, your objectives at the end. If I could just add two brief comments to that. I, I certainly agree that uh, I think hectoring is almost never useful in uh, inter international relations and, and global affairs because it simply doesn't allow a continuing conversation. And so much of trying to advance human rights discourse and reality is about a continuing set of relationships. Uh, so I think there are lots of things Canada can do. We used to be far more active in the area of human rights work on the ground with partners uh, than I think we've been for the last number of years. The second point is that we have to be willing to accept criticism. And sometimes, and I've seen this uh, at the uh, Human Rights Council, for example, uh, when Canada's criticized, uh, as we criticize other states, like other states, we get terribly defensive. And I, I, I sometimes think we just have to have more confidence in ourselves that we can accept some criticism and uh, really move beyond it and acknowledge that indeed, especially in relation to uh, our uh, relations with indigenous peoples, we've just not done a good job. And we still are not doing a good job. And one hopes this will get better. But I've seen Canadian government officials react so viscerally uh, when criticism takes place, and I think uh, we got to, we've got to get beyond that. Oh, and just to add, I, I would agree completely, and the, the universality of those UN mechanisms on un human rights is so important. That's really what gives us the locus standi to go in and, and talk to others about their own record, is because we are prepared to, to discuss our own situation. And just briefly on that before we go to the question, I remember a few years ago when the UN Special Rapporteur on Food came to Canada and uh, examined the North and said that we had a lot of work to do in terms of improving food security for Northern communities. Uh, he was lambasted by ministers at the time and I think there's certainly that defensive reaction in terms of things that Canada itself has to work on within our own borders. Uh, so we'll go to the next question. Thank you. It was a very interesting uh, panel. My name is Daniel Etchganer. I'm a lawyer based in Montreal. Um, so th this question is directed to, to Ms. Turk, but uh, g generally to the, to the panel uh, uh, in general. So um, regarding the issue of, uh, of migration, uh, you know, short of going into the Middle East and solving all, all the, the, their conflicts and all their problems, which is uh, obviously easier said than done, if we look at the European uh, sort of theater, we can see that they're sort of, uh, I don't, I don't want to exaggerate the issue, but it seems like they're the European Union is being uh, practically torn apart, uh, uh, you know, in, in some, mainly for, for economic reasons, but also for, you know, this migration issue, which has exploded now, uh, you know, so we, we've spoken about the Grexit, now there's the, the Brexit, and a lot of sort of um, uh, either extreme right-wing or left-wing parties being elected in various different countries. And so, but specifically with re regards to migration and, uh, and uh, Canada's role, so what, seeing as Canada does have a rich history in sort of diffusing these types of conflicts, if we look at, I don't know, Lester B. Pearson or, you know, the, the, the summits that we've had in Canada during World War II, what, what could Canada do, practically speaking, just, you know, uh, specifically, like, focusing on Europe, which is sort of like the entry way to, uh, for, the, for the migrants to, let's say, the, the, the rest of the world, what could they do to diffuse that sort of uh, 
uh, growing conflict, uh, specifically with regards to migrants entering, because it seems like the European Union is not doing a very good job of, of, of sort of managing that. And I guess, uh, well, Ms. Drake outlined a plan for, for Canada to be, you know, really more uh, aggressive when it comes to sort of resolving this issue. So I guess uh, I would give you the... <laughs> What I think is kind of interesting about the, the European situation is that the refugee crisis had been going on for quite a number of years um, and nobody really paid too much attention until these refugees began turning up uh, in Europe. And so perhaps if there'd been a little bit more foresight and, and investment in, in the region helping some of those frontline states um, with, uh, the, um, with their receiving of refugees, um, we might not see be in quite the same situation as we are um, with respect to Europe today. Um, I wouldn't presume to suggest that Canada can go in and, and sort of fix Europe's problems by any stretch of the imagination. But again, I think there could be some, some creative thinking, and this would not be for Canada to, to do alone or even necessarily to spearhead, but in collaboration with others, looking at um, a more orderly type of migration out of uh, the, the region, out of the Middle East, so that um, you know, there's better documentation of, of people leaving, that they're able to depart on trans, you know, met, using methods of transport uh, that do not put uh, lives at risk, and that there's some kind of orderly <coughs> processing of people when they arrive uh, within, within Europe. Um, and again, I think this requires some kind of, you know, larger approach to burden sharing with uh, the, the countries of, uh, uh, of the, the Middle East around um, the hosting of refugees, supporting them in their, uh, in their efforts to uh, deal with the, with the, the arriving migrants, um, and some kind of bargain around uh, agreeing to resettle a certain number of, of refugees and investing in uh, the receiving countries so that they can also integrate people into their population. But Stephen, I don't know, maybe you have something I, to I add? I agree with you. I would only reaffirm one point that you made in your, your presentation, which is um, in your reference back to traditions of Lester Pearson, et cetera, I, just, I think we have to be really careful about that right now. Uh, there is a certain degree of nostalgia associated with the, the current government. And we're not in the same position. The world is a very different place. I won't go into all of the reasons that's true. The, act, the kind of actors are different. But Canada's power is not what it was in relation to other states. There are many countries that are every bit as influential or more so than Canada. After the Second World War, we had a very particular role helping in the construction of major intergovernmental uh, institutions. We're going to have to work, just to reaffirm Jillian's point, very hard to build relationships to have the kind of influence we might imagine we would like to have. Uh, perhaps this mic over here. Hi. Uh, my name is David Salatino. I'm a McGill uh, graduate in chemical engineering. Um, my question is that we're talking a lot in this conference about uh, giving money to different organizations, to get different governments. Uh, to put into place programs to help the various people around the world in dif w with different issues, whether it be migration, whether it be economic development. What kind of, uh, I know that the Canadian government and the different organizations have traceability and accountability of the money that they give to make sure that it's distributed fairly and that it's used efficiently so that you don't have a lot of waste, uh, so that a lot of money doesn't end up in the wrong people's hands. Uh, how effective are those programs to make sure that what money we do give uh, goes to doing the best job that can? Do you want me to take a, a crack sure, at anybody. That? Um, well, I think the Canadian government, you know, for a long time has had a tradition of um, calling for transparency in international organizations of, of all types. They've been probably among the more rigorous in terms of calling for, for reform, getting organizations to open up their books um, mm. uh, to ensure that, that money is well spent and, and um, accounted for. Um, and also in, in insisting that, you know, that there be results as well, measurable results. Mm. Um, but uh, there's always more work to be done and, uh, you know, especially uh, in these kind of complex crisis situations. Um, there is always the potential for, for, for mismanagement, but um, 
I think that's why it's important that you know a government is engaged. And if you're uh, if you're not engaged, then you can't be uh, you can't shape the uh, you can't shape the process, and you can't shape the way uh, in which these these organizations operate. Mm -hmm. so. I was wondering if there were any audits, for example, that would have showed the results of how the money was used. And then uh, the government oh, could there, look back and say, well, of, yeah. this was very poorly used mm -hmm. or this was extremely efficient? Uh, there are lots of audits. And in fact, the UN has been moving over the last few years to opening up its, its books. And, and much of this is now you know, a public record. And mm -hmm. um, uh, I think there's some, some really good success stories out there in, uh, in terms of uh, new ways of uh, delivering programs that both reduce costs and, and improve results. Okay, and if they find out bad results, do they cut off that organization from helping, or at least show them ways to improve? Well, I'm. Uh, I would assume so. I uh, certain. I yeah. think the, the government has been, you know, quite uh, active in, um, you know, moving its money to those organizations that it considers to be the most uh, effective, whether that's NGOs that they're working with here mm -hmm. in Canada or um, or abroad, but. Um, a I don't have years, specific. A few years yeah. ago, there was actually an agreement of a number of states to reduce funding to UNESCO on exactly those grounds. So it, it does happen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank we'll you. Just, thank you. Uh, we'll move to this microphone over here. Hi, no, we'll straw. I want to bring Rob back here, not just out of politeness, because I really am interested in. I mean, you talked about, um, for example, the problem of the traditional foreign correspondent. Of course, the problem with the media now, the, the idea that there's going to be any foreign correspondence is, is up in, in question. Um, what kind of media can we reasonably hope for, and what kind of coverage of these issues, and what kind of relationship to public opinion can we reasonably hope for, or expect, or design in Canada in the next little while? I, mean. I, I think we're actually, thank you for the question, I think we're actually beyond hope now. I actually think there's a lot of stuff that's very exciting uh, that's happening now. I mean, I, I could point you to a number of different, he, here's what I do to stay on top of this. I, I teach a, a, a course, in addition to our fellowship, I teach a course in our, in, in our Master Global Affairs program to grad students who are interested in journalism issues. And at the beginning of each class, I have what we call the first 15. So I have two fellow, two students, I should say, who uh, present over 15 minutes some news site that they're following that I've never heard of. So it's basically a great excuse for me to stay on top of things. Um, and the stuff they're showing me is amazing. Some of it, most of it I've heard of. A lot of it I don't follow regularly. I increasingly follow regularly. I'll give you a great example. Uh, that illustrates exactly this point, The Intercept. So I don't know if people have know The Intercept or First Look Media. Uh, Glenn Greenwald, who was working for The Guardian at the time that he broke the Snowden story, at a certain point, Glenn Greenwald, Laura Poitras, who is his, his colleague as a filmmaker on that, uh, and Jeremy Scahill, who'd uh, written, I think, for The New Republic, uh, mostly on security issues, uh, felt that they were increasingly constrained by conventional media, even places that were as proactive and as supportive as The Guardian. And Pierre Midyar, the guy who founded eBay, uh, with actually one of our alumni, Jeffrey Skoll, uh, who had a lot of money and wants to engage in this stuff, basically went to, to Greenwald and Scahill and Poitras and said, I'll give you money, launch what you want to launch. If you go to the, so I was following it for a year or two and then there was some following it with different people at The Intercept and I stopped following it and it was brought back to my attention last week in class. Holy smokes, there is stuff there that, I, I mean, there is incredible stuff there. There is a depth of reporting just on the drone issues including leaked, uh, leaked stuff that went through kind of a, sort of the, the Snowden leaks on drones, but not just reported on the documents itself, using the documents as a basis for much broader reporting about the legal doc doctrines surrounding drones, around uh, the political issues surrounding drones, the defense doctrines, it's incredible. And that's just one issue that they have. Uh, there's another example uh, that's come up, uh, Global Post. Uh, which went through exactly the same kind of transition, then I'll stop because two, I think two examples start to illustrate the point. Uh, the Boston Globe used to have a, and they're one of our partners, so I've seen this evolve with them. They used to have a, a large foreign staff. They're one of these US city papers that had foreign correspondents everywhere, and, and they don't anymore. And the last foreign correspondent was a guy named uh, Charlie Sennett, who, uh, who left when he realized like it was up to him to turn off the lights when you left the Boston Globe foreign desk and went and found something called Global Post. Uh, I think it's had some financial problems, but the model is amazing. 
Uh, they are reporting using freelancers and stringers. They now have more reach than the New York Times foreign desk. They have more than 70 bureaus, but they're not old conventional bureaus. 70 bureaus around the world with people who are on some kind of a retainer with them where they also understand, look, these guys are going to be covering all sorts of other stuff for other people and doing other things. But they do transnational projects on migration, on the Shiite-Sunni fight, on et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, on global youth unemployment, global youth crisis, as global stories. Rich, rich, rich stuff. The other couple of names I'll throw to you are Vice. Vice is doing great foreign correspondence. Really gutsy stuff, actually. And to follow some of our alumni who are in that, who've actually been hired by Vice and are doing foreign correspondence, one of them is now in Mexico covering the Pope. They're doing stuff that, that the corpse will not do. I'm not sure if CBC has sent someone to cover the Pope in Mexico, but Vice has at least two people down there. So there's all sorts of stuff that's happening now that makes me quite enthusiastic. But the difference is that these are not full-time staffed foreign correspondents, typically. They're one of two things. They're either um, freelance contributors, maybe with a retainer. So they're on a flexible cost model, where they're allowed and encouraged to do other things, including consulting work, right? Uh, it's either that or they're locally based journalists, uh, which is sort of the vice model, locally based journalists feeding into a global enterprise. But there's a lot out there. I'm learning a lot more than I used to learn from the New York Times, all the news that's fit to print, not really in 40 pages, thank you very much, of which only 60% is actual copy. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> uh, so I believe we only have about five minutes left for questions. Uh, so we'll move to this mic and then we'll go back here, uh, but we'll close the lines. Hello, panel. Um, I'm Edison. I'm from uh, London. I'm here um, as a Jean Sauvé fellow uh, in Montreal for the year. Uh, my question is, um, given that, uh, Stephen, you mentioned Canada taking a more proactive approach to uh, sourcing where migration streams, refugee streams could come from. Um, given, with this in mind, my question is, given Canada's desire to also take a leadership role in climate change, what opportunities does Canada have in taking a proactive approach to the confluence of these two issues, given that we know that climate change will be a key driver to future migration streams? Thank you. Well, I'll begin. I'm sure others uh, will have comments. I, I would only say that you're, you're obviously right, that these two are not separate issues. Ob there are causes of conflict that are not climate related, and we have to be very conscious of those, but there are many and increasing uh, causes of conflict that do have climate relationships. So I actually think this is an area where, uh, to take up Gillian's point of, of thinking comprehensively, an element of the comprehensive strategy around migration has to be associated with uh, how we're trying to address climate change. That, that isn't to say that it's all one big mushy issue. I think if we start thinking of everything holistically, a word I hate, uh, then I think we actually can't tease out uh, enough very specific approaches. So uh, one of the things that I think needs to happen in, in uh, Gillian's suggestion is there have to be streams of work that are brought together, but where it's also clear that there are specificities. And so I think Canada, with limited resources and frankly limited influence, should decide which of these streams might make more sense for it to operate within. For example, and I'll stop here, it seems to me that one particular climate effect that Canada could be thinking about is drought and water because we are an important player in relation to water. There will be pressures on Canada from the United States over the next number of years. Let's get ahead of it and relate it to issues of migration. Uh, so I was told we actually have another 15 minutes left for questions now. <laughs> so feel free to come to the microphone and we'll go to that mic over there. From the USA, and I, my question is with regard to migration. We hear a lot that the way to, to end this issue is to get that region under control. I'm trying to get from you your opinion of what does it mean by under control? <laughs> um, is it uh, going in, um, when you say eliminate ISIS or take out ISIS, and then from there, put in an interim government? Do you keep military on the ground for a little while? Do you? Um, I'm trying to get an idea of what do we mean by under control to the point where, my, where people will want to move back, or what does that mean? Do you want to start on that? <laughs> you were going to start on that. <laughs> um, well, I don't know that I would, I would necessarily use the expression under control exactly. I think, um, you know, sort of looking at the current 
conflict in the in the Middle East and specifically uh, in Syria. I, I would think more about t in terms of um, establishing some kind of dialogue between the many different parties uh, that are involved in this this conflict, and we often tend to uh, to kind of focus on the government of Syria and the the rebel forces and ISIS or or ISIL, but uh, losing sight of the fact that um, there are a whole series of related issues in in Iraq, the involvement of Iran, the situ you know the position and the influence of Saudi Arabia and some of the other Gulf states uh, in the region, not to mention um, all of the outside actors who are involved, you know Russians, Americans um, and and others. So to me it's it's really part of uh, finding a way to establish a broader dialogue that would ultimately lead uh, to uh, some kind of resolution of the various conflicts that I, that I would say are uh, are ongoing, and the announcement, I guess, yesterday or the day before, that uh, there seems to have been some kind of agreement between the Russians and Americans that might now bring people back to the table to uh, to talk about, uh, you know, implementing some kind of a dialogue. I guess is is a very positive uh, is a positive sign, but I think we're a long way from from any kind of. Uh, of resolution of, uh, of the conflict. If, if I could just add two concepts which I think are relevant, I, and I agree, I, I don't think um, that we really can even imagine in many cases a, a serious, complete uh, holding on to uh, anything that approaches a healthy situation. So one of the uh, concepts is containment uh, and just not letting uh, terrible conflicts spread further than they already have. And this is not a pitch for one policy option or another, but theoretically that was part of what the airstrikes in uh, Iraq uh, and Syria are meant to do, is to contain, theoretically, uh, the conflict and not allow uh, further advance on the part of Daesh or uh, Islamic State. So that remains a, a, an idea that's important, whether the, the flights were a good idea is another story. But I think containing conflict sometimes may be the best you can do. The other idea that has really struck me recently, I have a young colleague at the uh, Monk School of Global Affairs whose name is John Lindsay, and he's working with a sustainability expert on what he calls sustainable conflict, and whether or not we really are in a new phase where there will simply be very many continuing conflicts that we have to simply sustain and, and contain and not stop. It's a troubling idea, but it may in fact have traction. Go to this microphone over here. And I come from Turkey, and uh, I spent, uh, I only arrived here in 2004, and I still go and spend at least four or five months a month, uh, a year in Turkey. Now, uh, the situation is uh, definitely uh, the refugees or who are in neighboring countries or in the camps do not intend to stay in those countries or integrate into those countries. I also watch in German uh, the news bulletins uh, that uh, they interview the uh, immigrants walking over and they all say, we want to go to Germany or England. None want to go to Spain, France, or Italy. So therefore, I think the West must very quickly come to terms that uh, this is not a refugee issue, but a, a immigration to the West and security of the West. Now, uh, most people and most families uh, do not have a whip uh, on their back, do not feel a whip on, the, on their back, to take the forward step of emigrating. It's not easy. However, when the bombs started coming down on their homes, they had nothing more to lose, so they took the step forward to immigrate. My uh, question is, not such a 
uh, easy solution, but I think the West must try to have safe areas on their land and try to get as much investment and work possibilities as much as possible, including schools and whatnot. I think you very eloquently said that bringing 25 or 50,000 immigrants to Canada is going to cost a hell of a lot more than building something on their own lands. Therefore, and one good example, which unfortunately shut down just four days ago, is the industrial zone between North Korea uh, uh, Korea and South Korea, where 100,000 North Koreans find jobs on the North Korean soil. Now, I think very soon the Western countries should try to align this kind of solutions, if at all possible, and I would like to hear, since there are many uh, foreign service experts in this uh, room, their ideas on how a step forward in this direction can be made. Thank you. Well, the, I think the only comment I would have is maybe just to go back to something I said in, in my remarks is that um, the lines today between refugees, IDPs, economic migrants, temporary workers are increasingly blurred and, and people can often fall into more than one category. Uh, they can start off as an economic migrant, but in fact, um, some of the uh, hardships that they can encounter along the way can actually perhaps put them into the category of a, either a displaced person or indeed a, a refugee. Um, we have, uh, you know, uh, thousands of, uh, of refugees who are living in some of the countries in the Gulf states who are not actually counted as refugees because those countries have not signed the 1951 convention, but they are in everything but name a, a refugee. And so it's very difficult to kind of categorize people, and uh, which is, I guess, another reason why I think maybe uh, it's time for a kind of a broader look at the whole question of, uh, of migration. And it's really, at the end of the day, about uh, ensuring that, you know, uh, human rights are, are respected, uh, that countries are able to manage their, their sovereign borders in a, in a, in a secure uh, kind of way, and that people have the opportunity to, um, you know, earn a living and, and uh, have a decent life for, for themselves and their family and to have security and, uh, and protection. We have uh, five minutes left, so we will go to those two questions and then we'll break for coffee. Um, I have a comment and a question. Um, I think my name is Colin Matthews, former uh, employee with the UN High Commissioner Refugees, so I thank you. Um, Stephen, I just want to say I think the point you brought up about the cost of resettling a small number of refugees to Canada and the amount that would be equal to 20 years of supporting UNHCR is a very important uh, um, policy that we need to have. Um, and thinking about the maximum impact Canada have, I, I, I'm, I'm somewhat, I, I, I agree with you, I think that's the question. My uh, other comment and question is for Gillian. Um, you cited that multiculturalism um, can be an important foreign policy tool for Canada. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll make a small counter argument. We're here in Montreal, Quebec. Quebec does not, in its official policy, does not respect multiculturalism. <laughs> it supports interculturalism. Um, and in Europe recently, we've had three major governments, the Netherlands, Germany, and Britain, that said multiculturalism is not working. It's creating parallel societies and it's breaking down social cohesion. So I'm, I'm wondering, is, is our experience with multiculturalism, is it, is it exceptional? Are we the only ones that really are doing it? And can that actually be brought back to Europe or to other parts of the world? Um, I didn't actually use the word multiculturalism. Um, <laughs> I, I, I kind of think of that as kind of a 1970s, 1980s concept, and I, I sort of hope we've moved a bit beyond that. I like to think more in terms of pluralism, which seems to me uh, more inclusive, um, and then doesn't kind of break people down into, into categories uh, so much. Um, and so I, th I think there is still something to be learned from the Canadian experience. I would agree that it is not, uh, you know, in completely transferable to, to other contexts. Uh, pluralism in Canada has grown up in a particular 
construct. It, 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 you know, it owes its roots to, I think, you know, Canada's origins. First of all, our indigenous peoples, the the two uh, two founding uh, nations, uh, you know, the, the French and the and the English. Um, our system of federalism. There are a whole set of um, you know characteristics, and of course, uh, waves of immigration over the years. Um, but I do think that there are also there are aspects about of Canadian pluralism that are applicable elsewhere, and those are some of the the principles that I think are enshrined in in the Charter um, and in the way that we look at minority rights uh, here, um, um, and indeed some of the kind of interesting things that are happening around um, First Nations self government, um, which you know could perhaps provide uh, models for uh, other countries looking at at ways to deal uh, with uh, you know, a range of, uh, of interests. Um, so not directly transferable, and I certainly don't think we should be in the business of kind of preaching to the world about how uh, they should manage their, their diversity. But if others think that there are things they can learn from us, I, I do think we have um, you know, experience to share. Okay. Can I add something yes. just uh, mm -hmm. uh, at, at the risk of stepping well beyond what my own area of knowledge is? Uh, but it strikes me, just listening to the nature of the conversation, that one of the things we're struggling with is, is a very Cartesian way of thinking, right? We're putting things into categories. Are you refugee and IDP, economic migrant, or just a migrant? Uh, that's one dimension of our sort of categorization. And then the other one is we're, we're thinking very much, it may just be the nature of the discussion, about government policy, government policy, government policy, whether it's multilateral, bilateral, whatever that is. I actually think that one of the opportunities here is to uh, think in a less Cartesian way, I was going to say holistic, but now that I know that my boss doesn't like that word, I'm not going to use it. Um, but somewhat more organically, and to allow ourselves to just really embrace the messiness and the complexity of this, uh, that people are not fitting into a category, that policies do not fit into categories, and that the players are not simple, right? One of the interesting things we learned out of having a government that had so massively withdrawn from the global discussion was that Canadians who wanted to engage in the global discussion realized that they didn't need government to do it. Uh, we could do it through ourselves, we do it through our agencies, through our communities, individually, through our organizations, whatever it was. Uh, and so I just encourage us to, when we encounter the Cartesian thinking of categories, to allow ourselves to tell a richer, more complex story. That's where it relates back to what, what I know, which is the depth of storytelling that we can allow ourselves and the complexity and messiness that we can allow ourselves to engage in. Hi, my name is Soraj, and I'm a third year student at this hotel's Faculty of Management at McGill. Uh, my question is actually for uh, Mr. Robert Steiner. In regards to what you said earlier about um, outsourcing work to local reporters when it's um, uh, instead of sending a person from your own team down there to get a new perspective. And I think that's really good because it's, it, it gives you a great platform for a globalization to occur in a, a more broader sense of the term and it gives you the correct perspective or a more realistic perspective. Uh, but what do you think when you enter um, a more precarious political situation where the fourth estate uh, might not necessarily exist in the mainstream media and you have to find local reporters who would be willing to risk their life and the local government um, acts as a deterrent um, to your stories. Um, do you think there is potential, uh, two, two parts, so first, how do you go about finding a reporter that would be willing to do that or is it the case that the reporters actually seek you out instead? And the second part to the question is, is there any potential there for the Canadian government to provide assistance in, let's say, the security of that, the, that those reporters in those countries, as we uh, saw in 2011 and 12 in the Arab Spring, that um, their lives get do are, are being put at risk, and it's not the most ideal situation. It's a very brave step for them to take um, to enter that um, agreement. So I, I want to thank you, first of all, for removing my rose-colored glasses, because sometimes I just look at the world with, with rose-colored glasses. Um, and miss complexity. But having said that, I'm going to like put on slightly tinted glasses back because there are. This is actually happening uh, under the most difficult circumstances. Not to make light of how easy this is or how, uh, how how frequent it's happening, how frequently it's happening. But there is even a group in Raqqa, right, the 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 ostensible capital of the Islamic State. There's a group in Raqqa that is actually filing stories. Um, I wish I remember Raqqa without. I forget what it's called. Uh, but there's a group in Raqqa that files stories from inside Raqqa about what life is like, daily life is like in the Islamic State. Uh, 
I had dinner at a conference in Italy a couple years ago with some folks from OSF, from the Open Society Foundation, who were working with North Koreans to smuggle stories out of North Korea. There were people reporting from inside North Korea, smuggling stories out on flash drives across the border into China, and they were then published in China. Uh, it happens. It's not easy. And, you know, of course, one always has to ask whether it's in a highly dangerous environment like that or in other kinds of environment. Who exactly are you corresponding with? That's where I think it's important to distinguish this kind of stuff, uh, citizen journalism from, from disciplined journalism, where a, where a journalist is working with an editor and an editor will have the disciplines to be able to assess what she or he's getting. I think it's happening um, in bits and pieces in different places. As to the question of diplomatic protection, this is not my area of knowledge at all, but I will refer back to one experience that I had. So as an early rep young reporter, I, was, I spent part of 1989 in, uh, in South Africa, right? So that was apartheid South Africa. It was a very dangerous time for reporters, for others, Civil Rights Act, obviously, they're anti-apartheid activists. It was a state of, it was a, there was a martial law, right, state of emergency. Um, and I was moved, like I can't tell you, to see that the Canadian embassy in South Africa, under the then Prime Minister Mulroney's direct orders, I understand it, basically functioned as a safe house for the opposition. And I, had got, I got to know the charge at the embassy in Pretoria quite well, a guy named John Schramm, uh, who's, who's a fantastic, I've lost touch with him, but a fantastic guy. I mean, I'm sure you know John. Uh, John um, made no bones about the fact that a whole bunch of, at the time they were a UDF, uh, United Democratic Front, but they were really uh, uh, ANC, people had his phone number on speed dial. And he would get in his car if he had to and go pick them up at a place and bring them to his house where they could be sheltered. And that was the role of the Canadian Embassy at the time. So I would love it if the Canadian Foreign Service felt that that, that kind of rescue mission and shelter mission, of which there seems to be a rich history in, in diplomacy, I mean, go back to the Swedes in, in Budapest, in 1944-45. Uh, in, in I would love it if that were part of the mission. I don't know if it is. I don't know if it's practical. I don't know the practicalities of it. Um, but I think it would be consistent with our values anyway. I'm speaking again with my rose-colored glasses. I don't know what it's like to actually be an ambassador <laughs> facing those circumstances. But uh. Uh, So this brings our panel to a close. We're going to want to be back oh, okay. over to uh, Will. <laughs>